Yeah, I remember when we got the funding or they announced the funding for Niji. Do you remember that? I do. It was at a Title VI conference. Yes. And we were in the session and they announced that University of North Dakota got the grant and then an earthquake hit. <laughs> I can't remember that. So it was just that, you know, that was a really strong reaction to that announcement. Welcome to the National Center on Elder Abuse podcast, your trusted source for the latest news, research, and policy in elder justice. The NCEA is excited to introduce the OGs of Elder Justice series, where you'll hear trailblazers in the field share their passions, joys, collaborations, challenges, and innovations, or any combination thereof through informal and candid conversations. In celebration of Native American Heritage Month, we're honored to host two OGs who have been at the forefront of addressing elder abuse in Indian country. Dr. Jackie Gray is a Choctaw Cherokee retired associate professor with the Center for Rural Health at the University of North Dakota School of Medicine and Health Sciences. She also served as director of the National Indigenous Elder Justice Initiative, a national resource center to address elder abuse in Indian country. Dr. Gray has worked to address health, mental health, and health disparities across Indian country for 40 years. She also serves on the NCA's advisory board. Cynthia LeCount is a proud member of the Turtle Mountain Chippewa. She is the director of the Office for American Indian, Alaska, Native, and Native Hawaiian Programs with the Administration for Community Living. Cynthia has oversight for Older Americans Act programs that serve American Indians, Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians, and diverse elders of racial and ethnic heritage. All right. Hello, Cynthia. Hello, Jackie Gray. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I just thought we could get started talking about when we first met. When we first met, you came to Trent Indian Service Area when I was tribal chair, maybe, or board chair, to be exact. And we were doing some mental health work. We were doing some BRFAS surveys, and we were talking about expanding into how we could expand into long-term care services. Uh, is uh, a 4th of July parade where uh, you were on the trailer bale of hay waving at people as they lit, they took the trailer around the circle. I don't know if it was at a park or something like that. That's, yes, down at Tissa Park. And that was one of our Tissa days, we called it. Trent Indian yes, Surf Area Tissa days. Yes, that's where it was. Did I have my princess wave on? You did. And I was, we had this big bus with Grand Forks Human Nutrition Research Center. Yes. And had the awning out and tables and chairs and were collecting data from people. Yes. Health and other aspects of health, health disparities. And so I'm glad it wasn't the year I was in the Halloween parade as Oscar the Grouch. Yeah, I think that was like around 2001, 2002. Probably. Somewhere around there. Long time ago. And then suddenly or after, then communications, and then we found ourselves in different roles, but still hanging out together. Uh, wasn't until, I think you joined ACL about the same time that the, that NIGI, the National Indigenous Elder Justice Initiative, got funded. I was, I was after that, I was actually working for Joanne Kaufman, Kaufman Associates, as the contractor for the TNTA for Title VI, but I was around all the time and then moved, moved into that. So yes, I was, I was in the background cheering when you got that award. So, so we've had lots of different things that we've worked with over the years. We absolutely have. But are, are, you know, kind of interesting. Yeah, we've had lots of different, we've come from lots of different directions, but we've still headed in the same, our goal has still been the same. To, to improve the health of, of Native people. Yes. Yeah, I remember when we got the funding, or they announced the funding for Niji. Do you remember that? I do. It was at a Title VI conference? Yes. 
and we were in the session and they announced that University of North Dakota got the grant and then an earthquake hit. <laughs> I can't remember that. So it was just that, you know, that was a really strong reaction to that announcement. <laughs> so, and I think it was that was the reaction because we were going to start openly discussing such a an unbelievable thing. Yes. Yeah. We were bringing it out in the open. Yeah. Yeah. When I first heard in, in, in when I was with way, way back before then, I was with Great Lakes Inter Tribal Council in 1985 when we were awarded one of the first three elder abuse grants. And I remember then puffing up my chest and thinking, this is going to be so cool to show all these white guys how well we treat our elders and we're going to be models. It's just going to be, we're going to show them, we're going to show those guys. And then as I started talking to the elders and they started, I started listening, not talking. I started listening to the elders and, and the realization came and, and still we were sort of hush about it. We didn't have money. We didn't have nothing. We just sort of talked a little bit. And then all of a sudden here comes this resource center where we very publicly say, this is an issue. Yeah. And, you know, there were just so many great moments during the time that we had Niji that was over spanned, I don't know, 12 or 13 years. Yes. Yes. And, you know, I think of some of the, the big things that come to mind for me are, you know, what we did in setting up models and all for elder abuse codes. Yes. When, when we contacted 500 and I think 88 different tribal units. Not all, you know, all of them, all the federal, re, uh, federal plus. It's to then the other little ones yep. around and found out that only about 40 had an elder abuse code. And that's when we really knew that our was cut out for us. And, and 40 had an elder abuse code and only 60 had ever even thought of it. I mean, I'm throwing that number in. Very few of us had even thought of it. Right. And so, you know, it took quite a bit pulling together, you know, what needs to be in an elder abuse code. And we did a lot of listening to the elders mm -hmm. about what they thought needed to be in it. Mm -hmm. And I remember that first year that every time I spoke, there was someone bringing up spiritual abuse. Yes. And we didn't see anything anywhere on spiritual abuse. Nope. And so that's when we started working on that article that uh, kind of defined spiritual abuse in Indian country. My being a psychologist pushed you into the mental health arena. Yes, probably, probably. Yeah, because yeah, then we started talking emotional abuse, and certainly spiritual abuse took a, a life of its own. Yeah, and I remember you and I being at another meeting in New Orleans. Ah, uh, yep. And uh, we had been talking about there just wasn't any data around natives and elder abuse and we kept you know looking at you know was anybody doing anything to gather data for natives and everywhere we went there was not no one was even talking about data and you leaned over to me and you said i think we're gonna have to do it ourselves oh yep well and part of that too because tribes are sovereign and so we each have our own programs or our own systems and and because of laws jurisdiction all of that weaves together and do we work with states not a lot are we really private and what happens yeah absolutely and so where is the place for our data and and how can we collect it how can it be collected right yes and and then we started you know moving in those directions Yep. And trying to find some ways of doing that and started to gradually begin gathering some data. So, you know, all of that has just come about from this little resource center. Yep. Yep. And and thinking, you know, we still we still are struggling with data collection and how we can, you know, certainly encourage each tribe to collect their own data. But then when can it become aggregate data? When can we how can how how? Yep. So we, we're still struggling with that. Absolutely. You also, through Niji, were able to fund those first, what was it, 20 grants? 
Yeah, those innovation grants that went out to 20 different tribes. Which was the first money coming in. It was little itty bitty bits of nickels and dimes, but it was some money coming in to focus. It was $20,000 a piece. Yes, yes. For one year. And that was to just kind of try to move them a little bit farther than what they were already. Yes, yes. They were successful. I'm sure there were some that weren't able to move beyond that first, that initial money. But look at the ones that we have that have been successful and have moved on. And some of those grants you had have applied and I have received our new money that we've just finally gotten to give out. So there's there's been some continuation of that work. And it's really taken almost 15 years yes. to get any additional money. I, I remember in the beginning, you were trying to figure out how you could patch together money even to fund us. Yes. Yep. This is, and, and we're not there yet. We've got, we've got a really long way to go in getting this, these programs and this work into, into Indian country and into Alaska and, and helping develop a sound, viable, their own system. And we don't have to be a part of it. I, you know, I respect very much that they need to do this a sovereign with, you know, on their own. But we just want to make sure it's happening. And I know I learned more about legal than I ever thought we wanted to know. There's just so much to learn about it. But then when we started doing those those uh, training modules. Mm -hmm. Those are so good. And, you know, I was thinking about just putting up webinars, but that's not going to work for us in Indian country. And I had to go back to the drawing board. Mm -hmm. And that's what I hooked up with. Kathy Smart over in instructional design, and we started trying to figure out what's going to be the best way to deliver training modules on elder abuse in Indian country where they don't have a lot of access and, you know, there are places that they have to choose between turning on the lights and turning on the computer and things like that. So we had to really back up, but I think we really came away with an exceptional product. I think we did too. And I think we we um, made the world aware that elder abuse in Indian country is more than just helping individual elders that enable to, in order to do that, like you said, legal. What's the legalities of it? Who can we reach out to help? Who can come in to help? What are the laws of the tribe? What are the services available? Every single place is so unique that we have to, we have to somehow develop a template a skeleton and let these tribes we did with these modules and these webinars and this training gave us the floor to stand on anyway you talked about tribal sovereignty but then we found out that it was more than just tribal sovereignty it was public law 280 states yep. which were those that the tribes had given so their sovereignty over to the state and so the state kind of had jurisdiction on some of the elder abuse stuff, where the other states, the tribes had that. And then we started putting together the charts, you know, on, okay, who was the victim? Who was the offender? Where did it take place? And that determining who had jurisdiction. Yes. And it was a really complex chart. Yes. And then the complexities all around everything you did of who's the elder going to allow to assist them? Right. Who's the elder going to talk to? Who are they going to trust? Susie Q that comes in from the county office? Maybe not. So we had a lot of fun along the way, too. We sure did. We learned so much. And I think, you know, I, I, we're, not, we're, not those, we're, we're not the old ladies to blow our own horns. But we've been around a long time. And just look at, we've been dealing, talking elder abuse in Indian country publicly, using the word since 1985. And we have, we've, We've come a long way in doing that, and we've got, we know we've got a long way to go, but we've laid the path to get there. I and it also kind of opened the door on some other things like grandparents raising grandchildren yeah. and how that's a form of psychological and financial abuse. When those seniors I talked to in 1985 in, on the Lacoudere Reservation in Wisconsin identified their daughters or whoever 
dropping kids off so that they could go play bingo and they're going to be gone for three hours and they're gone for six days. And they identified that as a form of abuse. I almost fell over because I think, oh, we're so cultural. We want our grandkids around all the time. And now I'm old and I have them. And no, I don't want them around all the time. And neither did those elders. But yes. And then they expanded on that. But that meant they gave up their food and their bed and their sleep and their, and their worry. That was that those huge. That those were hard things to talk about, and and talking about the spiritual aspect of abuse and how how an elder feels when they're told, "No, Grandma, it's too hard to get you to the powwow because you're in a wheelchair, and and we it's too hard to do. We'll just bring you a piece of fry bread and we'll take some pictures." Yeah, yeah, and the heartbreak that brings. Yeah, we learned a lot, Jackie Gray. We did. What was most memorable as far as our collaboration to you? You know, in all of this work, back in Wisconsin in 1985, and um, feeling like I was becoming part of Wisconsin, the theme we chose was respect to your elders. And I've tried really hard in my life to live that respect to your elders. I spent lots of time with my own Indian grandma. My dad was my hero. And I think that leads my work, is that respect and that honor that I'm really proud to be who I am and the child of who I am. So respect. What, what about you? What's your leading force? And picture you with your Star Wars sword. What's your leading force? Uh, you know, I think back to our Niji mission of restoring respect and dignity by honoring our Native elders. There you go. That that, you know, from the beginning, that's what we wanted to do was, what did we want the outcome to be? We didn't want to focus on the abuse. We wanted to focus on what we wanted the outcome to be, which was that respect and dignity for our elders. Yes. And, you know, that was part of the beautiful work that we did in Wisconsin way back that I have carried with me forever. And when you talk about elder abuse with our, you can't do that without your heart breaking. But... Talk about how did how did this happen? That we know this isn't our tradition. We know that our our teachings don't mention this. So being able to put together the pieces of boarding schools and abuse and and all the pol federal policies that came to us and changed who we were. And the elders said, "That's what's happened. Now let's change it and let's learn our language. Let's learn." Our ways again. I, I think that's a really full circle that we've we've led. We're a part of that circle, Jack and Gray. Yes, I remember the the um, what do you call them? The little groups that you put together, and you had one at a NICOA conference this year, or not this year? That year, you were holding five or six or eight around the country, and one was at NICOA, and I listened to. A Navajo elder talk about a neighbor and what was happening with that neighbor. And that Navajo elder cried. And so I remember these heart-wrenching. I mean, look at what gifts we received from the elders that they trusted us to do this work for them. And and those stories really led the work that we did. Yes. I remember every time in that first year that I spoke about elder abuse at any of the conferences, I would have a line of Native elders yes. coming up to tell me stories and crying as they told me about friends and neighbors and relatives and what was happening to them. And it just felt helpless to be able to do anything to help yes. them. Yes. And they challenged, they challenged us, you know, have this resource center find solutions. Yes. And so, you know, that, that's a heavy burden to carry back for those elders. It absolutely is. And that's part of what we, we've done too, Jackie, just because of our longevity in this work and what we've done. We are seen as leaders in it, and we are seen as hope we can make a change. Yes. yes. So what brought you the greatest joy in all of this work that we've done over the years? Certainly talking talking with elders, heart-to-heart -heart conversations with elders, listening, um, knowing that they trust me, mm -hmm. that's, and, and knowing that 
we're making a difference. That's I am, I've always said when I when I in my in my years after I'm gone, I just want people to say she made a difference. And I think I think we are making a difference. I suppose as a grandmother, I should say my children and grandchildren. I should have said that. Put the rest of that out, but that's not true. Jackie, what's been your greatest joy? <laughs> oh, there have been so many, and especially, you know, the work that we've done together, that, you know, we've been able to do it with a sense of, of humor and fun and engaging everyone along with it. I agree with you that making a difference, but that we've been able to do it with a sense of joy. Yep. Yeah, and I watch our programs, and I call them ours, they are, but I like Shoshone Bannock with their, what are they on their eighth or ninth annual conference? Oh, I think they're like 10th or 15th now, you know, she's done such a great job there. Yes. And these other, you know, Carla even has her conference and, and, at, and down in, in Nevada. So watching what's happening around the country and thinking, I had a little bit to do with that. Look at them go. Well, and Margaret Carson and the yeah, uh, look at Muckleshoot. Muckleshoot work that she's doing restorative justice. Yes. And Helen, Helen uh, Gray. Helen Gray in OHOC. Yes. Yes. All of these are just really exciting to see our children grow. You know, OHOC got one of our new grits. So, yes, our children are growing. Our flock, we have flock. We're raising a whole new crop. <laughs> <laughs> we are. It's so fun. Hey, Jackie Gray. Before we finish, you know, we've talked about what really drives us in our work, and we've talked about what makes us happiest. If there was one principle, one major principle, one thing about you, about who you are, about what you do that has guided your work and your kept you going. I think the thing that comes to mind the most for me is giving back. Yeah. And, you know, yes, giving to the elders, but but in a lot of other ways as well, is making sure we're giving back so that the, the culture, the community, the the whole population continues to thrive. What about you? What What is that one guiding principle that you feel like you have? As you know, I was raised in a tribal area, and that has partly to do with the history of our tribe, or my particular tribe. But I was raised in off-reservation. And there was four or five families in our community that were tribal, and we were all related. <laughs> and so I was, I always knew who I was. But I wasn't raised in an area where I got to, uh, I got to see that. I got to have that every day. So I grew up with this strange desire to always prove who I was and to show that, yes, I'm Indian, and yes, I know this. And I know what that means. And this work with the elders, this work I've done my entire life, has allowed me to to learn or to accept that I'm okay, am who I feel like I am. And all I ever wanted to do was to be a part of this community and to make a difference. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please stay tuned for our next podcast featuring OGs, Erica Wood and Naomi Karp, attorneys, guardianship experts, and longtime collaborators and friends.